Okay, so that's it. This has to do with. Okay, so x is 15 to the beginning. And it gives us x plus infinite 1, and then back on the outside, what is on the outside? So that's the answer. It's probably x plus plus. That's x plus equal to? Yeah, x plus equal to. But it's the same as the x plus plus. No, no. no. x plus plus and x plus equal to are very different. Okay. Yeah, x plus equal to is increase of x by whatever is on the right hand side. So that's an, an entirely different thing. All right, so that's fine. Okay. Okay. Never mind. Okay. All right. It is nine o'clock, so I'm gonna get started. Um, well, first of all, I'm gonna tell you guys your new about your new homework assignment first, and then we'll kind of go back and talk about what you need to do in order to uh, get the homework assignment done. And this is called Find Max 2. And it's a pretty quick, I don't think it's going to be a very difficult homework assignment. Um, but then I'm not the one who can actually evaluate you know, the difficulty of the homework assignment. So I'll just kind of go ahead and read it. And if you guys have any questions right now, go ahead and ask the questions. But I will go over enough concepts in today's class so that you can actually you know, go ahead and do it. All right, so let's start with the, the description first. To do this homework assignment, you must follow these instructions or else my semi-automatic script will not be able to correctly process your submission, okay? So that means, you know, you kind of have to follow all the conventions, you know, uppercase, lowercase, you know, file names, folder names, and how you create the archive file that you will be turning in. In the home folder of your, of your user account, it doesn't have to be the user user account. If you already use Linux natively, you can just use whatever usual account that you use normally. Create a folder called FindMax2. Okay, so you use MKDIR or make a directory to create a folder. The actual name does not have quotes and is case sensitive, just to be sure. Okay, because some people um, you know, change the name slightly or change the case slightly, and that would not be picked up by the script. Next, create a file called main.cpp. You know, once again, you know, it's without the quotes and it's case sensitive, with the basic code as follows. So I'm giving you a, you know, basically the, the template of your homework assignment here. Um, line one is a pound include line. It's going to include a header file called standard int.h so that we can make use of the fixed width um, <coughs> integer types. So int32 underscore t, which is the mean, which means, you know, 32-bit integer signed is, you know, you need to pound include in order to make use of those names. Um, line two to line four is the definition of a subroutine, but as you can see, it is empty because that's your homework assignment, is to implement a subroutine like that. And then on from line six to line 10, um, yeah, I know it doesn't show up well. This is actually line 11. That's the main subroutine, which you do not need to change. And find max two, as the name implies, is going to find the maximum of the two parameters that you pass to it. So in this particular case, because I invoke or call find max two with parameters one and two, it should return two in this case, because two is the maximum of one and two. All right, <clears throat> any questions up to this point? <coughs> questions, okay. So your job is to specify or finish up, finish you know, find max two, so that it returns the maximum of the two variables or the two parameters <coughs> to be more exact you are not allowed to call any other functions. So there may be a maximum function in C or C++, but you're not supposed to use it. Um, uh, and of course, you will need a return statement in addition to all the operators that we have discussed you know, up to this point. So that would include all the usual plus, minus, you know, uh, multiplications, division, uh, the unary operators, you know, plus, plus, minus, minus, the uh, ternary operator, the question mark and the colon, um, and you know all the operators that we have talked about. If you think that you know, a bit shifter may be useful in this case, go ahead and make, a, you make use of a bit shifter. I have never seen anyone make use of a bit it's a shifter in a program like this, but <coughs> you know, maybe somebody can figure out, hey, I can do it with a bit shifter. 
All right. So in the main function, local variable x, which is this one here, would store the maximum of the one and two, and the answer is obvious. So if you put a breakpoint right on this line here, x should be two by the time you get to the breakpoint when you run the program. But I will test the program using my own quote unquote secret test cases. Now, you know, to test a program to find the maximum of two variables, there are really only so many things I can test it, right? Four, two, you know, the first number being larger than the second <coughs> one, two, four, the second number being larger than the first number, or four, four, you know, the two numbers being the same. Okay? Um, I, you know, so, so you can, you can kind of use your own imagination to come up with test cases that you'll be using to test your own program. You are not allowed to t alter the main program in any way or the main function in any way when you turn in your homework. So for those of you who rely on you know, C out or some other ways to test your program, you can do it, but don't turn that in unless you have <coughs> undone the changes to main. So main should be the way it is right now on the projector. <clears throat> if you insert any additional code or make any modifications, be sure to undo those changes prior to turning in your homework assignment. When you're all done, turn in the homework as follows. You have to get to find max2 as your <coughs> current directory, current working directory first, and then you can run this command, which is not really, should not be foreign, because you know, by this time, you know, the first homework assignment um, should have you know, sunk in already, and you know, that's, the, that's the whole command. And this time I did use a fixed uh, width font, so it's easier to see you know, where the spaces are and which one is uppercase and which one is lowercase and so on. <coughs> so this will create findmax2done.tar.gz in the home directory. Um, you need to upload that file to the submission interface of this homework assignment to turn it in. And that's basically your next homework assignment. And you have one week to do it. So if you are thinking, you know, well, maybe I will run into some kind of difficulty getting to getting this homework assignment done, I would suggest that we start early, okay? Start as, as early as possible, because we are meeting on Wednesday. So if you have any questions, I can try to answer those on Wednesday. Um, actually, you have a little bit more time than one week, because Monday is a holiday, so I'm not gonna you know, collect the homework assignment on Monday. I will collect it instead on Tuesday, so you have one day more than usual to get this done. Are there any questions? No questions? <coughs> All right. So what we'll do today is to talk about the mechanisms that we'll need. Oh. <laughs> so we'll talk about all the constructs that you will need in order to get this homework assignment done. Okay. And by the end of today's class, okay, you, you should have enough you know, tools to get this done. Okay? You might, okay, I, I, I will quote those uh, toys, you know, the packaging from toy, uh, of toy, pa fine prints of toy packages. Some assembly may be required. Okay, so I'll give you the tools, I'll give you the pieces, uh, but then you have to kind of find out you know, how to connect those pieces together. <coughs> Which is a big part of programming, is you know how do you how do you get all the pieces together? So I'm going to leave this one on its own tab, you know, just in case we have to kind of switch back to it occasionally. Okay. So the other day we talked about functions in general already, um, and I used GDB to trace it to just kind of show you guys how a function works. And we dealt we dealt with some kind of interesting functions. You know, we dealt with some uh, recursive function the other day. Um, but for the most part, let me just kind of change the font a little bit so it shows a little bit better like that. So for the most part, a function has you know basic four main parts. This is the, the first part, which is um, what we call the return type. It basically dictates where the it, where an invocation of this function can go. So if the return type is an integer, then the invocation of the function can go wherever an integer value can go. Okay, so you can use it for comparing, you can use it for multiplication, subtraction, division, and so on. That's, where, that's what the return type is for. This is the name of the function, you know, which is right after the return type. Um, I just use f you know, as a simple you know, uh, function name. You can definitely change it to something else you know, when you're writing an actual useful function. After that would be a list of parameters. 
In other words, these are, um, this is a mechanism where the invocation of the subroutine can communicate with the subroutine being invoked, being called. Um, so right here, the example is right here. This is where I call the subroutine, and whoops, this would be a better way to do it. This is where I you know, call the subroutine. So two and three are what we call arguments to basically fit into the parameters. Two is an argument that goes into parameter x because it is the first one, and three is an argument that goes into parameter y because it is the second one. So by the time I get into the subroutine because of this invocation, this x would have a value of two, this y would have a value of three, and that's how parameters work. Are there any questions about um, the purpose of parameters or basically how they work? No questions? All right, yeah, go ahead. I believe so, let's double check. So, yes, I am recording. All right. So we kind of talked about this part too, you know, at runtime, you know, what happens when you invoke a subroutine. So at runtime, what happens when you invoke a subroutine is space is allocated and values initialized for the parameters. So the parameters actually take up space in memory when you invoke a subroutine. A value that is passed to a parameter is called an argument. So argument refers to the, to the thing that you fit into here when you're invoking and a parameter refers to the name of the thing that receives the value from the perspective of the sub subroutine or the function itself. The allocation or the location of the next step is saved. Now when I talk about next step here, it is next to the invocation of the subroutine because the subroutine needs to know where to go back to. So this is the step where that information is saved because otherwise, at the end of the execution of a subroutine, we would not know where to go, go back to or how to continue execution. If a subroutine has any local variables, which I'll talk about today too, um, it will be allocated and potentially initialized at this point, and then we'll have execution continuing at the beginning of the body of a subroutine. And then you will just execute the subroutine as usual, or the function, at the end of the execution of a subroutine, possibly due to a return statement, we'll do the following. So I would just kind of like to stop here. When I say a subroutine or function in this class, they're basically the same thing. Okay, they're just basically different names because of different conventions, but they refer to exactly the same thing in this class. So at the end of the execution of a subroutine, a, an optional return value can be specified. Now this is not optional if the subroutine has a return type of not void, like integer, then you are obligated to return a particular integer value. Local variables are the this are the allocated at this point. In other words, all the local variables will cease to exist at the end of the execution of a function. Okay, they, they only start to exist when a subroutine starts, but they will cease to exist at the end of the execution of a subroutine. Now that part is really kind of important because you have to remember local variables and parameters are not always there. They're only there when a subroutine is called. Execution will continue at the location that we saved a little bit earlier, which is step two in this sequence of operation. And then at that point, arguments will also be deallocated because remember arguments are allocated on the fly prior to uh, continuing execution in the subroutine. And then the optional return value is utilized you know, wherever the invocation of the subroutine is, then it will start to use the, uh, the return value as a particular value. So if the invocation of a subroutine is in an addition, then the return value will be used in the addition. All right, so are there any questions about these particular steps? Anything that needs clarification? Questions? It's all good so far? Okay. Now these steps happen for every invocation of a subroutine. That means even if a function is recursive um, and there'll be multiple arguments and multiple local variables allocated and initialized. So it depends on which point of time we are talking about. 
in the recursive uh, subroutine call. If there are no questions about this, we're going to move on to the next slide. And the next slide is definitely related to this as well. It talks about you know, how to return a value, and this is a really short slide. A function can specify a return type. So in this case, we have a very simple return type, which is just int. Um, and if I don't specify you know, whether it's int 32 underscore t or whatnot, then it's just using the default width depending on the platform. If you're using a 32-bit platform, which I am doing now, it will be a 32-bit wide integer. If you're using a 64-bit platform, it will be a 64-bit integer instead. The return type of a function helps the compiler determine where an invocation of a function can be placed. So in this case, because the return type of f is an integer, that means I can call f in, in, at any place where an integer is expected. So in main, I am calling f on the right-hand side of this assignment operation. But that's OK, because x is an integer. And so you know, x equals to an integer value is fine. So that's basically what that means. Are there any questions about uh, this sample program? No questions? All right. Um, so the rest of this really is the same thing as you know what we talked about, you know, what I talked about a little bit earlier. The next question is, can a return value be ignored? In other words, a function is returning an integer, but I'm not doing anything with that integer value. And the answer is yes, you can in fact you know, ignore the return value of a function. And sometimes you know it's quote unquote the proper thing to do. Most of the time, it is not. So unlike many programming languages, many other types of programming languages, C, C++ allows you to ignore the return value of an invocation of a function. This means that even if f returns a particular value of integer type, you can invoke f all by itself, doing absolutely nothing about the return value. So f can, the invocation of f can stand on its own somewhere in the program where the return value is not utilized for anything. You're, you're not using it for any calculation, for any assignment, for any comparison. It's just tossed away. That's perfectly OK as far as the syntax is concerned. Generally speaking, this is not a good approach because the return value of a function usually is useful. Okay? There are only several cases where it is not the case. It is just a handy thing that, is, that will allow you to write more cryptic code. But in general, it is not a good idea to throw that away. Okay. So by the time we get to subroutines that are fall into the category where the return value is just to enable people to write more obscure code, I will point it out and say, OK, this is just here to make it possible to write code that is more difficult to understand. But if everything will fit on one line or one expression. And it's, you know, I will point that out when we get to that point. So the next question is, what if a return statement is missing? In other words, what if we have a subroutine that looks like this, but nowhere in the subroutine we have a return statement that specifies a return value? Well, as it turns out, syntactically, that's OK, too. The C compiler will actually allow you to do something like that. <clears throat> if you don't turn on warn all in the compiler, it won't even complain about it or warn you about it. It will just silently compile the program and go like, well, you did specify that this function is supposed to return an integer value, but I guess if you don't feel like it, it's OK with me. <laughs> but there's always a return value. Even if you don't have a return statement that explicitly states a return value, there is always a value that it is returning. If you don't have a return statement, it simply means you're not controlling the value being returned. Okay. So it would just return some bogus you know, junk value at the end of the execution of a function if you do not specify a return value. So that is a very, very bad programming practice. Because if it just so happens to return a sensible value, you may not even know that your program has a fault in it. Okay? Every function has a return type, even those that has nothing to return. <laughs> So if you have a function that has absolutely no value to return, then you have to specify the return type to be void. 
when the, you have a return type of void, it means you know it, there's really nothing to be returned. It cannot go a place where an integer or any type of value is expected. Are we still doing okay so far with this? Okay, all right. So we are moving on. So as far as your homework assignment is concerned, um, do you or do you not need a return statement? Yep, you do need a return statement because you're supposed to return the maximum of two variables, right? So if you don't have a return statement, the caller or whoever is invoking the subroutine is not going to be able to get the maximum value. So you do need a return, va return statement. All right. I just uh, realized I forgot one more thing, but I'll, I'll talk about this and then hopefully I will remember to talk about it. Um, local variables and parameters, these are very closely related to functions because they are things that you can do when you are inside a function, inside the definition of a function. We have already talked about parameters quite a few times already, but it doesn't hurt to see another example here. So a parameter is a way for a caller you know, whatever code that is invoking the subroutine to pass information to a subroutine that is being called. So I would just call that, sometimes it's called a callee, C-A-L-L-E-E, -E, because it is the subroutine being called. Let us consider the following example. So in this case, we have a simple function definition like this, where there are two parameters, X and Y, and we specify the return value is just the sum of X and Y. The utilization of this subroutine is over here, where we call subroutine f with you know, 2 and 5 as individual parameters. So what happens here is 2, as an argument, is going to go to the first parameter, which is x. 5, as the second argument, goes to the second parameter, which is y. So by the time I continue execution in subroutine f, x will be 2 and y will be 5. So 2 plus 5 is going to be 7. So the value being returned by the return statement on line 3 is going to be 7. 7 will now take the place of the entire invocation, which is the right-hand side of an assignment operation. Z gets the value of 7, and that's it. That's the end of this particular um, invocation of F. So since I remember today, I'm going to pass the row sheet right here. And I cross out the, row, the, the columns corresponding to dates that I forgot to take row, which is pretty much every single day except for the first class. <laughs> okay. Now, the most important part here is to understand that x and y are local. Okay? So that means this x is only visible inside this block of code here. This y is only visible inside this block of code. Elsewhere in the program, I can reuse the name x and y for whatever purpose I want. Are we doing okay so far as far as the scope of a parameter is concerned? A scope simply means, you know, when, where is this particular name, you know, meaningful or have this particular meaning? So in this case, x is a parameter of function f only within this range of the program. Elsewhere in the program, I can reuse x for whatever purpose I want, and it would not interfere with the meaning of x within this context. And the same thing applies to y. All right. Are there any questions about the scope of a parameter? Okay. okay. If there are no questions, we'll move on to local variables. A local variable is many ways like a parameter because those two are actually kind of related in a very strange way. Except that local variables are not specified by the invocation of a subroutine. So I will show you a particular example here. Instead, a local variable is visible only to the function that contains its definition. So even the caller of a subroutine has no visibility, has no way to access <coughs> local variables. In this case, um, okay, this example does not apply to local variables, but down a few rows, a few lines, so there will be a, an example, example to illustrate that. 
In addition, local variables can be declared in any block statement. In other words, every time you use the open curly brace symbol, you can define more local variables. Okay? So if you want to, you can use you know, several levels or nesting of open curly braces, and at each level, you can define additional local variables. But the most important part is the most local name mask all the other definitions of the same name. And I have an example to illustrate that, and we can create more examples if there are questions about it. Local variables are not used by the caller of a subroutine to communicate with a subroutine or function. It is only used within a function to keep track of values that are useful only within that function. And that's why it's called a local variable, because it is only used inside the function itself. Okay, there's an analogy if you want to remember using an, an analogy. Parameters are like inboxes, okay, to an office. It is a way for people to submit things for whoever the worker is inside the room to, you know, and say, okay, this is my, this is form X, this is form Y, now you can get started working, okay? Local variables are kind of like a little pile of post-its or notebook that is inside the office but people outside of the office has no visibility whatsoever of those you know, post-its or notebooks or notepads or just you know, scrap paper and whatnot. Okay, so one is an interface to the outside world, which are the parameters. The other one would be just usable inside the subroutine, and those are local variables. In this case, we have um, two subroutines. Okay? So this example, example one, is only here to illustrate the fact that we can reuse names of a parameter. Because from line one to line four, we have the definition of function f, which makes use of x and y as names of parameters. But the meaningful, or the, the meaning of x and the meaning of y only lasts from line one to line four. Once we are done with the definition of function f, the names x and y are not bound to these parameters anymore. So that means, you know, on line five to line eight, if I want to define another subroutine, I can reuse the names x and y with no interference or no problems whatsoever. Any questions about example one? It's just illustrating you know, the scope of parameters is only for the duration or for the um, definition of a subroutine itself. In example two, we have some kind of weird um, local variable things because we have one single function definition here. This, is ent this entire thing is one function definition. And we have you know, fun parameter x and we have parameter y. So within the first open curly brace, which is called a block statement, we have a local variable z. This is how we declare a local variable. You indicate the type of the local variable, and then you just say, okay, the name of this local variable is z. So right away, we use a computation on line five in assignment operation, and say local variable z is the sum of the two parameters, x and y. Okay, that's pretty <coughs> easy to do. But what then I do is I open another curly brace, okay? There's no limitation whatsoever where you can open a curly brace or a new block statement in C functions, okay? So for no particular reason, I can say, hey, you know what? I want to open a new block statement here, and that's fine. But also within any block statement, you can define its own local variable. So right here, I am declaring a local variable x. This is not a parameter, it is a local variable. So from here, inside this block here, inside this block statement, which is technically from line six all the way to line nine, x is no longer referring to the parameter. It is now just referring to the local variable x. And this is what we call masking, because when you have a local scope that redefines a name that already has a meaning before that, for that single block, it will only retain the most local definition, the most local you know, uh, meaning. So, that means on line eight, we are not changing the parameter to the sum of z and y. We are only changing this local variable x to z plus y. Do we have any questions about line eight or what variable it is actually changing? It cannot change parameter x because parameter x is masked for the time being. 
said okay so far? Okay. Now, once we get out of this block statement, we would have lost the local variable x. Okay, or the definition of local variable x would be gone. So that means on line 10, this is not line 0, it is line 10, but that means on line 10, when I refer to x, which x am I referring to? The one on the top, which is a, which is a parameter, okay? So it's going to return the same value as parameter x, not, um, not the, uh, if you look at this one here, it is actually, if you look at this z, this x, because x is z plus y, and z is x plus y, so this x actually would be um, x plus 2y, okay? But that's not the value that I'm returning. I'm just returning whatever the parameter is in this case. Are there any questions about example two? Yep, go ahead. So if on line six, instead you have closed the bar again, then the local variable z would disappear? If I close? On line six, instead of keeping another open one, you closed it? If I close it, okay, so that's a, that's a good question. So on line six, if I have a closed curly brace, in other words, if I move this one all the way to line six, is that what your question yeah. is? Um, yes, then it will close the entire function. But once you close the entire function on line six, the rest of this code will be meaningless because it is not a inside the function definition anymore. So the, the function definition is um, signified, or the ending of the function definition is signified by this end curly brace. <coughs> All right, that's a good question. Any other follow-up question? Any clarification? No questions? Right. If there are no questions, we'll look at example three. Example three looks like this, okay? We have one function definition, two function definitions, and three function definitions here. And what this one wants to illustrate with is really the same thing as kind of the first one, which is the name of a parameter is local to the definition of that function. So in this case, <coughs> this is one function definition. So x only has the meaning of a parameter from line one to line four. And then after line four, you know, x would no longer be associated as a parameter of f. Um, same thing from you know, here. <coughs> G is another function. It takes whatever parameter x has and it returns three added to that particular value. And now we have G, uh, excuse me, we have h, and h makes use of G and f, okay? So what it would do is it will take whatever value is passed to this parameter and in return it will pass it to function g. Function g will just say, okay, whatever it is, I'm gonna add three to it and return it as a value. That value in return will become the argument to function f. And then function f will do its job, okay? It will just basically say, okay, what, what is the value passed to me? I'll return twice of that because x plus x is the same thing as <coughs> 2x. So that's how you know, this particular function h is going to do. Any questions about example three? No questions about example three? All right, that's it. So I think we have all the tools, all the pieces that we need to do the homework assignment. Is anyone convinced that we have all the pieces, all the tools that we have that we need? Oh, this is, I have to remind you guys, that we are not supposed to use any control structures. Okay, so I'm gonna put that into the homework assignment just so that you know, it is explicit instead of uh, being implicit. So I'm gonna make it very explicit here that we cannot use any control statement or cannot use conditional statement, loops, or anything like that. Okay, just expressions and the return statement. So let me just find the place where it's supposed to go. It's still doable, it's just that you have to figure out you know, how to do it. You're not permitted to do this, okay. And I'm going 
going to use italic here um, because in all right. So instead of working on this particular homework assignment, I'm going to work on something that is related to it. Actually, I did it last time already, but I'm going to do it again because you know some of you might have forgotten what I have done. You know, in the previous in the pre previous class, I cannot remember which class it was either. <clears throat> so what we'll do is we're going to write a subroutine that returns the absolute value of an integer. I think I'm pretty sure we have done it before. Okay, so we'll go ahead and do it again today, and we'll just say I'll use I'll do it in the temp folder. So I'm just going to create a subfolder here called ABS to change the subfolder. So every time I do something like this, I'm actually re-illustrating how to use certain commands. Okay, make dir mkdir creates a folder. cd change directory allows you to change into whatever folder you specify. Okay, so I'm not doing this, you know, like just you know whatever, just because I need to do it. I'm doing it because I want to re-illustrate how to use certain commands in this class. Um, I use v Vim. You can use it on uh, Nano or some other editors. <clears throat> so I'm gonna you know, just write a simple program like this one here, and count include stdint.h, which is a header file, so that I can make use of integers that have a particular <coughs> width. And in32 underscore t is a 32-bit integer, and I'll just call this the you know, tax uh, absolute value function. And in order for this to be an absolute function value, I'm going to give it a signed integer that can be positive or negative. <coughs> okay. So what I want to do is to say, well, since it has to return the absolute value of x, I really have two cases to deal with, right? Because if x is non-negative to begin with, I can just return x. There's nothing to do. On the other hand, if x is negative, I have to negate the value of x so that it goes from a negative value <coughs> to a positive value. So I really have two cases to deal with. Um, and since I'm not allowed to use any control structure, like a conditional statement, if then statement, how do I do it? We do have one operator that can deal with this, right? The ternary operator, okay? The question mark and the colon, okay? So in this case, I need a single return statement, okay? <coughs> because if you try to specify any statement after a return statement in C and C++, all additional statements are basically ignored because the return statement not only specifies the return value, but it will also trigger the return operation like right away. It will continue execution where um, right after the uh, invocation of the subroutine. So I'm going to have a single return statement here. The format to use a ternary operator is there are three components. And this is just the way I write code. Okay, you definitely don't have to use the same way as you know what I usually do in class. But I like to do it this way because it is structurally done, you know, from the get-go. Okay, because right now I have clearly identified the three pieces of a ternary operator, um, and I don't have to worry about you know missing close parentheses either because if they're all handled right away. So what I do is I will go back to specify what is supposed to be in the first one. The first one is a condition, okay? This is just a condition. If it is true, we go for the middle one. If it is false, we go for the last one. So I'm, you can do it either way, okay? You can check whether x is greater than or equal to zero, or you can check whether x is less than zero. You just have to kind of flip the middle part and the last part, okay? So this is the true value. This is the value that or this is the true expression, I should say expression. This is the expression that will be evaluated and returned when x is in fact greater than or equal to zero. Well, since this is the absolute function, we can just put x here, because if x is already greater than or equal to zero, there's nothing I need to do. I will just pass the parameter back to just, the way it is, just the way it was, okay? Um, remember to sign the row sheet when you're done, okay? <clears throat> On the other hand, the last component, the third component, is the false expression, which means I evaluate and use the value of this expression as the overall uh, value of the ternary operator when x is greater than or equal to zero is false. 
or you know, in this case, you know, it means x is less than zero. So in this case, I just want to take the negation of x like that because x is confirmed to be negative if I ever end up here. And that will do the absolute function. And I think this is, if I were to estimate this one, I would say this is maybe 75% of your homework assignment. Well, not counting the typing part, but just the you know, constructing you know, what kind of operator, how to structure your code, and stuff like that. So I'm going to just test it here. Okay? And this is going to be useful, too, because I will use this to help um, illustrate you know, how you can test your program to see whether it works or not. Because I'm going to use a very trivial you know, test case first, and then we'll go ahead and um, illustrate you know, how to test your program with more meaningful things without even having to recompile your program. All right. So are there any questions about the sample program that I have written here? Yep. You're saying z is set equal to the function and then the parameter is going to be zero? Correct. So what, what's happening on line 12 is z, OK, overall speaking, this is an assignment operation because of the single equal symbol. So that means I have to figure out what is the value of the right-hand side, and then I will copy that to the left-hand side, which is a variable z, local variable z. <coughs> Right. So what have so in order to figure out the value of the right hand side, which is a function call, I would pass zero as an argument to parameter x. And then execution continues inside the definition of the <coughs> function. But since it only has one single return statement, that's it's that this is all that it's gonna do. So it will basically just uh, return whatever expression is on the right hand side of the return keyword. And that turns out to be just one single ternary operator that can evaluate a condition and then decide what to do with it. Is, is that answering your question? OK. <clears throat> Any other questions before we compile and trace this program using GDB? No questions? Actually, uh, yep, go ahead. How you uh, save the file and um, I'm using VI, you know, which has a steeper learning curve. Uh, if you use Nano, it is a little bit easier because you know it has quote unquote online help, you know, which is just uh, at the bottom part of the screen. Okay. So that will be an easier one to use if you want to, you know, just learn a qu uh, text editor. Right. Yep. But in VI, you know, the way we get out is to use a colon key. You know, press the colon key and press X it will both save and get out of the editor at the same time. <coughs> so now we're back to the command line prompt. Yes? Um, before you, um, about that side of code, uh -huh. can you write x equal or greater than 0 instead of x greater or equals 0? It has to be like this. Yeah, because, we, because the greater than or equal to symbol is exactly how it is defined here. So if you reverse it, it doesn't work. Right, so the first thing we have to do is to compile the program. And once again, I'm doing this you know, just to illustrate you know, all the commands that you will have to do as well when you are working on your homework assignment. So I typically like to type you know, warn all, you know, just, because, just because I want a compiler to give me as much warning as possible. Uh, pedantic you know, is something that is super unnecessary in this class because we are not really touching on um, any features of C and C++ that is not um, in the NC standard. So you don't have to type pedantic if you don't want to. Uh, dash G is really useful because it allows us to use uh, GDB later on. Dash C is uh, to compile the program without linking it. So we specify the source code. And the complaints about Z is initialized, set, but not used. It's not referred to. But that's OK. We have seen this one before. You, we know what it's complaining about. And the next step is to link the program. So we use a dash O to specify the name of the executable. And then we give it the object code file name, which is abs.o. In this case, it links. And we use GDB to debug the program. Okay. The program is pretty you know, simple. We put a breakpoint on line 12. And then we run the program. 
And the first time you do this, it may not be a bad idea to trace the program just to see what it does, okay? So if we want to trace the program, you use step to step into the subroutine that is being called, which is uh, tax absolute function. And right here, you can now say, okay, what is x? You know, you don't even have to do that because the single step trace is already showing you that parameter x has a value of zero. <coughs> so you single step again back into you know, the main program and it is already done, oh, wait, hold on. It, it wants to do the close curly brace as a separate line, so now we are back to the main program. So at this point, z has a value already and you can print it out and not very excitingly, z has a value of zero, okay? Because the absolute value of zero is zero. So in this case, the program doesn't seem to be very helpful to debug it because um, if I choose either expression, which is x or negative x, it will still return zero, right? Because zero is zero with the middle one. Zero is also negative zero, which means, you know, if, even if I had a problem with this program, with the code, it would not have shown me any error. So how do I test this program with other test cases? Well, I could get out of GDB re-edit the file, give it a different test case, recompile, relink, get back into GDB, and run the program again to test it. Or I can do it like this. I can just say print tax absolute value and give it a value of, say, negative 5, and it gives me back 5. Okay, seems to work. Let's give it a negative, I mean, a, a non-negative value, and it works too. So this is your quick and easy way to test your code, okay, is just to use the print statement inside GDB. Then you can give it, you know, a, a number of test cases without having to, you know, re get out of GDB, do all the editing, relink, and then go back into it to test it again. Are there any questions about the steps that I have been that I have taken so far to write the program, to test the program, and so on? Questions? This is all good. Okay, all right. All right. So you might want to spend some time to think about the homework assignment, okay? Because, you know, I mean, you do have to get the other 25% done. I mean, remember I said this is like 75% of the homework assignment already. So you just have to kind of figure out what the other 25% is. Uh, and you have a whole week to do it too. So just remember to do it because I think the problem with giving you guys a whole week to work on this one is not, there's not enough time, it's, there's too much time. And people think, ah, I can put it off, it's so easy to do. And then comes you know, next Tuesday, go like, oh man, it's due on that nine o'clock. You know, I forgot about it altogether. So get it done, you know, you might want to get it done like during the lab time today, you know, get it done, turn it in and forget about it. Well, not to forget about it, <laughs> but not having to worry about it anymore. I don't want you guys to forget stuff that you're supposed to learn in this class. All right. Any other questions? Yep. Is there a way to, like, uh, copy, uh, select the text? In, uh, <laughs> <laughs> not easily, because because with this one, it is, um, because of the line number, kind of interferes with it. So you probably just have to retype the whole thing. Would Which doesn't up? take much time. Sorry? What if you push up hmm? the up arrow key? The up that? arrow key? He's asking, I think he's asking how to copy and paste from the browser. Um, yeah. it's, it's possible. Sorry? It's, it's possible. It's possible? Yes. Okay. How? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, you know, you can, I can give it a try. It's not that much code to type either. <coughs> oh, okay. I guess it does work. Just copy and paste. But I mean into nano. Oh, into nano? Yeah. Well, you can't you can't really do it into nano unless you are using PuTTY or some other terminal program. You can't do it inside, you know, Notepad and then, you know, copy whatever file that you use Notepad to create into the virtual machine. You know, that works too. Uh, I get it. Yep. But it really is not that much code, you know, just yeah. type it. <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions? You can see the, the left edge is not showing, so let me see if I can fix that. 
auto setup. There you go. Are there any questions about the return statement? Any questions about the um, operators that we have talked about so far? Any questions about the so quiz that is due today at 9 o'clock? Yep. Okay. So you have two iterative statements. So one of them is going to be line 5 and one of them is going to be the left line. C can you ask the question again? I mean, we have two iterative statements. One of them is going to be the, the, the last line and one of them is going to be line 5. No, you just need one return statement. You just need one here. That's why I worked on my own program, you know, which is, which shows you most of the things that you need. With a, you know, it's very close. Yeah. <laughs> yep. When you create the grade points, like, uh, like if you wanted for grade twelve, you said E twelve. How do you access? It, what, what was the command? Like? To set a breakpoint? Yeah. It's B space 12. Yeah, B for break, and then 12 is the line number that you want it to stop. All right, any other questions? No other questions? Oh, really? I mean, that's a. Then we're going to have to move on and talk about new stuff. All right, so I will move on to talk about some new stuff here, and it has to do with modular programming, okay? So modular programming is a slide, as you can see, that has no coding whatsoever because it does not just apply to C and C++. It applies to any type of programming and any type of design, actually. So modular design, if you look, at the, it look, look it up in the context of programming or just engineering in general, uh, it means you know you have components that are first of all reusable, okay. And between the components, we have well-defined interfaces. And the third one is insulation from changes. So if you want to make changes to one component, it would not have a whole lot of impact to other components. That's basically what a modular design is, okay. And we have been using, we have been benefiting benefiting from modular design on a daily basis. It's just that we don't even realize that is the case. Okay? So let's think about reusable. Reusable means you, know, you don't need to specialize something and create a new instance or you know, make something new every single time. You want to do something similar. Okay? You can reuse the same thing over and over again. Okay? How many of you have a thumb drive? Now, do you have one thumb drive per computer? Because every computer has a different need. No, you can use the same thumb drive on most, if not all, computers, right? So that is reusable, which is great. Well, which interface, what is the interface of your thumb drive to a computer? USB. It's USB, okay, is it well defined? Is it just something that Microsoft makes use of and then if you switch to another operating system or a different computer, you have to use a different standard? It used to be like that with Apple trying to push its FireWire thing, but that's no longer true, right? I mean, even Apple is putting you know, USB ports on all of their computers. And insulation from changes. When you upgrade your computer, do you have to buy new thumb drives all over again? thumb drives will work with a newer computer, right? So even if you have a really, really, really old USB thumb drive, that is USB 1.1, okay, it will still work on a brand spanking new computer that has a USB 3.0 interface because USB 3.0 is backward compatible. So that is you know, the insulation from change because you can change your computer all day long, but the, the drive will still work. And it works the other way too. Okay, if you have a <coughs> really old computer and a brand spanking new USB 3.0 digital thumb drive, it will still be backward compatible as well. So the insulation works in both directions. Okay, but specific in the context of programming, we are basically talking about reusable code. So what do we mean by reusable code? So that the first thing is, it means you know instead of using copy and paste. We want to extract code that is commonly reused and turn those into some way that can be reused easily. Okay? 
Okay, and subroutine is the first way to do it. It's not the only way or the proper way in some cases because we have object-oriented programming, but that's you know, something that we will talk about or your professor will talk about in CISP 400, not in 360. But in 360, when we talk about reusable code, it is usually referring to subroutines. Okay, you can call a subroutine from multiple places. So a function is definitely support of, uh, supportive of this particular objective because a block of code, if a block <coughs> of code is sprinkled throughout the program using copy and paste, it is more effective to turn this block of code into a function and replace each block with a invocation of the function. It's, we haven't really gotten into examples to illustrate it, but you can just kind of imagine that you, if you have something that you want to do over and over again, but at different parts of the program, instead of using copy and paste, it makes more sense to define a single subroutine and then just call that subroutine from multiple places so that you don't have to copy and paste. Okay. Why is it such a bad idea to copy and paste? Don't learn as quickly. It's mm -hmm. better just type it out every time. Sorry. <laughs> From the perspective of the student, if you type it out every time, you're going right. to be better than just copying and pasting. Okay. And, uh, I guess you're more liable to make mistakes if you just grab uh -huh. blocks and move them around in your code. Yep. Anyone else want to uh, add to why we do not want to copy and paste? <coughs> it's inefficient. It looks cleaner, and if you want to make it one change, one change, you change the functions that all the instances you use it. Yep. Because you only have one function, so if you, you know, change it once, you know, at the definition of the subroutine, then every invocation of the subroutine will also, you know, have that change, quote unquote, have that change built into it. Um, the other problem with subroutine is, uh, I mean, not having subroutine and using copy and paste is, what if you have a logic problem? What if you have a bug? before you copied and paste. And that bug was copied and pasted several times. And when you discover that that piece of code has a problem and you have to fix it, now you have to find all the instances. You have to find all the places where it has been pasted. If you miss one, what happens? The compiler cannot help you. Okay, no, no tool can help you. So the main reason why we want to use re reusable code it's so that it's easier to fix problems when you if you, you fix it once and you fix all the instances. Well-defined module interface. This characteristic means the return type and parameters of a function should be well thought out before the implementation and the publication to minimize frequent changes. That basically means, you know, it's kind of like, you know, USB, you know, 2.0. You don't want to release like a half baked you know, uh, specification of USB and then say, oh, you know what, we have changed our you know, mind. Instead of using a 5 volt you know, power <coughs> supply, we want to use 3.3 volts. And that will render all the existing thumb drives unusable. That would be a bad, you know, that would be a big <coughs> fiasco if you think about it you know, from the hardware perspective. So this is basically saying the same thing. In software, if you are going to work with other people, you want to think. You, know, you want to uh, plan out the interface of a function before you tell other people and say, you know what, I have a function that can do da 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 da. Okay, because if you if it's not well planned out and you release the specification of, of your function and everybody is starting to use it already and then you decide, you know what, that was not really such a great idea. I'm going to change it now. And all of those people who are making use of your function, they will also have to make changes accordingly. And that would not be a good thing. Okay. Are there any questions about this part here? Because it is not easy to see um, the potential problems of a not so well-defined interface when you're dealing with homework assignments. And it's not just limited to this class. The longest program you will probably write as a computer science major, I understand some of you will not be you know, taking more programming classes after this, but as a computer science you know, major, um, even in a four-year university, the longest program you'll write is probably, I would say, between one and 2,000 lines long, which is nothing. That's like nothing compared to what people do in industry. In industry, people deal with 
you know, programs that are easily half a million line you know, long, and not a single person is going to be responsible for the entire program. So that means you will have other people working with you, which also means whatever function you create, there'll be other people making use of that. And that's why it is important to make everything well-defined and say, once it's published, we do not change it. Okay. <clears throat> uh, insulation from change, you know, which is related to the previous one, this characteristic means by carefully defining functions collectively, a change or, of implementation should incur minimal impact to the overall code of a program. At this point, we don't have enough examples to really illustrate, illustrate this. So instead of doing it from the perspective of programming or coding, I'm going to switch a little bit to your TV, okay? Your television. Um, how many people are old enough to remember the CRT type of uh, television? A few, okay. <laughs> It'll be fewer and fewer, but then you know, we'll have newer technology to talk about too. Okay. Um, how many people still remember the analog broadcast instead of digital broadcast? Okay, so people, you know, we're definitely pushing the, the envelope here. Um, so the question is, is the way you operate a television really that much different depending on whether it's a CRT, whether it's plasma, or whether it's LED, uh, LCD, um, or whether it is using traditional broadcast, you know, analog broadcast, digital broadcast, or cable? Is it all that different, or do you think it's about the same to operate the TV? It's about the same? Okay. That is insulation from changes. Okay, so not counting the really, really old you know, TV set that has a you know, manual switch to change channel, you know, anything that has a remote control, probably look about the same you know, regardless of the broadcast you know, signal or the technology behind the television technology. Okay, so that's insulation from change. Um, the rest of this, we'll get back to this later on, because at this point, we, don't, we haven't seen enough subroutines to have to, to talk about this part. So we'll come back and talk about this later. Are there any questions about this slide, which is all about you know, what is modular programming? Any questions about this part? No questions about this part. We are going to kind of move on. We'll move on to a scope and the lifespan of variables, which is something that we have talked about already. I think there's really not much you know, new to talk about here, except you know the uh, the threat of global variables, global evil. Okay, so we'll talk about global variables, and we'll try to understand why it is a bad idea, okay? Okay, up to this point, every single sample program that I have written do not make use of global variables. They only make use of local variables and also parameters, but there are no <coughs> global variables whatsoever, okay? So I'm going to give you an example of, you know, a program that makes use of a global variable and then we'll go back here and talk about why it is not, as not such a good idea. So I'm going to write this program called GABS, you know, which is a program that calculates the absolute value, but it makes use of a global variable. So what, what I'll do is I'm going to do the same thing, pound include stdint.h. And we'll still have a function called ABS, okay? <clears throat> but this time I'm going to make use of global variables for everything, okay? So I'm going to declare a global variable here. That is a global variable. How do we know this is a global variable? Well, first of all, is it inside any type of curly brace for the blocks? Nope. So anything that is declared outside of the definition of a function is a global variable. Right, so we'll go ahead and implement our function here. Okay, so we'll say, um, well, this time I'm going to use use void as a return type of a subroutine because you know 
with a global variable, we can we can get around almost everything with global variable, which is one of the things why it is so evil. And this is my absolute value subroutine. It's not it does not need any parameter anymore because I can use global variables. Okay. So inside this subroutine, I'm going to say. Well, you know what? I'm going to assume global variable x is the input to this subroutine. And also, it will serve as the output of this subroutine. Okay? So I'm going to say you know, x is, and same thing, use a ternary operator here. Same type of you know, operation. If x is greater than or equal to 0. Now, there are two ways to do this. Uh, I'll, I'll just do it the same way. I don't want to introduce any confusion point. Okay. All right. So let's stop here for a moment. On line 7, it definitely refers to something with the name of x. At that point, what can possibly, what, what can that be? Do we have any parameter? No. Do we have any local variables? Nope. So x has to be referring to the global variable x. Is that okay? All right. So now we go to the main subroutine, and then we do the same thing as last time. This time we have a local variable, you know, z, and then we say x is negative five. Let's go ahead and call abs. Okay, so abs is called all by itself, okay, because it does not return any value that can be used. And then after that we can say z equals to x, and then we have a return zero. So this program is now doing exactly the same thing, almost exactly the same thing as the other program, which is to calculate the absolute value of something and then store that into local variable z. For those of you who say, but it's not using the same type as last time, okay, fine, we'll go ahead and fix that too. Okay, so we'll just fix these, okay? So now they're pretty much exactly the same thing as last time. Okay. Well, so the first thing we want to do is to figure out, okay, is the program going to work? I mean, is that really the same thing? One thing we notice is we can refer to x here inside ABS as a subroutine. We can also refer to x here inside main. And those two are re now referring to exactly the same global variable. Right? Because the name of a global variable means the variable is visible throughout the entire program. Now the scope actually goes beyond that a little bit, but until we get to multi-file compiling, we won't be talking about it just yet. So at this point, we just understand a global variable is visible throughout the entire file, okay, the entire source code file. So in this case, x is <coughs> visible in any subroutine. We can access the same global variable anywhere within this program which seems like a pretty handy feature, okay? So the first thing is, you know, let's go ahead and check out this program and see whether it works or not. So dash one all, pedantic, dash c, dash g, g, a, b, s, c, b, p. And it gives us the same warning as last time, okay, because local variable z is set but not used. And then we'll go ahead and link the program. Yes. Oh, uh, oh, then we we'll go ahead and debug the program. G yes. <clears throat> we'll put a breakpoint on line 14, okay, just so that we can check what is the initial value of x. So we run the program. This is before line 14 executes, and we say print x. X has a value of 0, single step, and now x has a value of negative 5. No big surprises here single step into the subroutine. So now we are not in main anymore. We are now in ABS. But in ABS, we can print x. And hey, this is great. This is convenient. It is the same global variable x that main is initializing to negative 5. So this is great. I don't need any stinking parameter anymore because you know I can use a global variable to pass things around. Single step here and print x. x is now 5 because the uh, the right-hand side of the assignment operation is getting its job done, which is to calculate the absolute value of an integer. Hey, this is even better. I don't need no stinking you know, return statement anymore. I can use a global variable for that purpose. So it seems like a global variable is really useful. 
Single step, we are now back to the main program. X is now changed already. Let's just confirm that. And single step, my local variable Z is now you know, 5 also, and the program is done. This is great. Well, it's only great when the program is this short, okay? And remember, what did I say again? You know, what was the typical size of a commercial program? Half a million lines or so, okay? Okay, so let's imagine this. Half a million lines of code probably broken up into many, many different source files. And you're making use of global variables, okay? Can you keep track of how those global variables are used in every single subroutine? Probably not, okay? So that means, um, that means you know, very common names for global variables like counter, okay? So let's say you, know, you have a, a global variable called a counter, okay? And as the name implies, it's not really that much of a rocket science, right? It is used for counting, okay? Counting up, counting down, whatever. But if one subroutine is using it already, and that subroutine is calling another subroutine that also needs to do some counting, how does one subroutine know that counter <coughs> is already being used by another subroutine and it should not be used again? It does not, right? So you end up with different subroutines making use of the same global variable for different purposes. So when one subroutine returns to the other subroutine, counter would have been changed already, but the other subroutine did not anticipate this to happen, and so your program is not going to work correctly. Is that okay so far, you know, with that general concept of why global variables are not a good idea? Okay. <clears throat> the, the problem with a global variable is not easy to uh, see when you're only dealing with programs, even up to a few hundred lines. Okay, if you have a, if you write a program that is up to a, a few hundred lines, you will still not be able to experience you know why global variables are not such a great idea. Okay, it's only when you're dealing with uh, programs up to thousands of lines long, at least, then you will start to run into issues um, that you will say, oh man, you know I wish I didn't use global variables for this purpose. So now I'm switching back to the slide here, now that we know how to make use of a global <coughs> variable. Let's go back here and then start from the beginning. Global variables are global, but it is also very evil, okay? Um, there are a few cases where global variables are truly called for, where they are required. Nonetheless, most of the time, they are abused to, as a quick fix to enhance a program or to fix a problem and it can lead to maintenance disaster down the line, okay? Um, so the first thing we do is to say, how do, how do we declare a global variable? And just as we have, just, just as I have demonstrated a little bit earlier, any variable declared out of the context of the definition of a subroutine or function, you know, we use those two words interchangeably in this class, is global. So if I go back to this program and just look at the source code, you can see that the declaration of X is not inside the definition of a subroutine or function. That makes it a global variable. So switching back to the notes here. <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about static just yet. Okay, you know, we'll, we'll just kind of focus on the single concept of global global variable. We'll, we'll go to the lifespan and the scope of global variables, and we want to contrast these with local variables. All global variables, regardless of static or not, start to exist and initialize as soon as the main function gets control. It actually starts a little bit before that too, but you know, for our purposes, we can just say that when main is called, when you have control in main, all global variables start to exist already and they start to have quote unquote values already. Okay. And they don't cease to exist until your program is all done. Okay. So unlike local variables, which only start to exist when you invoke a subroutine and they cease to exist when the subroutine is done, global, vari global variables are always there. Do not confuse the scope, which is basically the visibility of a global variable, with the lifespan, which is how, for the duration, what is the duration that a global variable can retain its value. 
um, because one talks about when it is visible, the other one talks about you know, where, when it can maintain its value. So those two are different things, completely different things. And I'm going, I'm going to move on to this slide here, why global variables are in general evil. Now, if there is a feature that is really obscure and there's really no place to use it, it cannot be an evil thing because nobody's going to use it. Okay? Global variables are evil because they're very tempting. Okay? A lot of times when you're dealing with a program and you have something to fix or you want to add a new feature to it, a lot of times, hey, we can just make a new global variable to fix that problem. Or we can use a global variable to enhance a particular program, to add a feature to a program. It's very tempting to use global variables. The problem with a global variable is that the subroutine can access it without explicitly declaring that it will access that particular global variable. Let's go back to the source code here. If, uh, if you just look at, this is what we call the prototype of a subroutine. Does this indicate whatsoever that it is going to access a global variable x? Nope. Just from the name of the subroutine and from the list of parameters or the return type, you, does, you don't know that it's going to access a particular global variable. Okay, well, but that's, what is the big deal here? Let's, let's go back and look at the other program. In fact, we'll look at both programs side by side so that we can look at a program that has global variable and one that does not, okay? So now we have side by side, the left-hand side is the one that makes use of local variable and parameters doing things the proper way. Nope, I take it back, never mind. <laughs> the left-hand side is the one that makes use of global variables, and then the right-hand side is the one that does not make use of global variables. It only makes use of parameters and local variables. Okay, so when you look at line three over here, the, uh, the prototype of the subroutine, which basically talks about the return type and also what kind of parameter it takes, it tells you right away, you know, this is the extent of it, okay? It takes a parameter x, which is an integer type, and it returns an integer value. Um, but since I'm not using any global variable, I don't have to worry about text absolute subroutine um, you know, changing anything that is global. There's no need to worry about it. Are we doing okay so far with this? On the other hand, as soon as you make use of global variable, looking at the prototype of subroutine is no longer enough to tell you um, how the rest of your program can be affected by calling this subroutine. Is that okay? It's kind of like it, 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 it can make changes. Okay, let, let, let's go back a little bit here. When you look at this particular subroutine, most people can say, but it's easy, okay? It only has one line of code, which is line seven, and it's clearly making use of global <coughs> variable x. So what is the big deal about <clears throat> it's difficult to check whether a particular subroutine is going to change a global variable or not? It's easy, it's easy and easy. I can tell right away that you know this particular subroutine is going to make use of, it's gonna read from and also change global variable x. What is the fallacy of that particular argument? How many functions, how many subroutines do you think will have one line as the body? Probably not a whole lot, okay? There will be subroutines like that, but a typical subroutine is not gonna be that short, okay? So let's say this subroutine has 20, 30 lines, which is fairly typical, okay? It's not even considered a long subroutine. Out of a 20 to 30 line you know, subroutine, how do you spot that it only makes use of uh, local variables and parameters? Well, is it easy? Nope, it's not easy. So it's very easy for someone to sneak in and make use of a global variable, and it remains somewhat undetectable. That is the problem, okay? <clears throat> Range is not coming from outside of it. Do you guys want to close the door? I mean, if you guys are distracting, you can just go ahead and. Oh, okay. 
So that really is the bottom line of you know, why global variables are clinical evil, is because of that. It has to do with the access of a global variable. It can be a read access, can be a write access, can be both. It's not reflected in the arguments passed as parameters. For smaller programs, it doesn't seem like a problem, but when a program grows in size and complexity, this can easily become a maintenance you know, nightmare because it's really hard to keep track of which subroutine is making what use of which global variable. Now, the evil of global variable, um, okay, so I'm gonna go through this too. For, for example, upon the return of a subroutine, a global variable is changed incorrectly or corrupted. Let's say you have a problem. That is the end result of that. But the problem is, which subroutine is responsible? It's hard to track it down because a global variable needs not be passed as a parameter, an argument to a parameter. So what I'll do is I'll give you what we call a call tree. Okay? A call tree is really just displaying which subroutine can potentially be calling which other subroutine. Okay? So I'll give you a fairly simple call tree. So we'll just say that we start with main. Because every sub every program has to start with a main subroutine. So we'll just say that main calls you know f equals g equals h, okay? <coughs> which is unrealistic. Okay, it only calls three subroutines. F in return will call f1, f2, f3, and I don't even care about the control structure here. I just need to know which subroutine has the potential of calling which other subroutine. And okay, the f2 calls you know f. To A, F to B, and so on. Okay, this is what we call the call tree. And the thing is, F itself does not need to access or make use of a global variable by itself. Only one of the subroutine that it calls can make use of a global variable, and then F, in effect, is also making use of that global variable. Is that making any sense? So if I drill this down like 20 levels, okay, I eventually get to a subroutine called Z, okay? And Z makes use of a global variable. That makes this entire, you know, branch all the way up to main to make use of a global variable. Is that, is that working out so far? Okay, so if there's a problem with calling, you know, one of these subroutines, how do you track it down and say, well, can it be F2 that is causing the problem? Is F2 accessing a global variable? How do you know? You cannot just read the source code of F2 because it calls F2A and F2B. And then you look at F2A and you say, oh, F2A itself is not making use of any global variable, but there's no guarantee that the calling of F2A is not going to change any global variable because it also has other subroutines that it's calling. Is that okay so far? So even if you know, okay, at the end of calling F2, a particular global variable is trashed, okay? It is modified in a way it's not supposed to be, okay? But how do you track down who is responsible for that? You have to keep drilling down, okay? Everything that can potentially be called when F2 itself is called, you have to track down every single subroutine and see how they make use or not make use of the global variable that is in, being in question. That makes it very hard to deal with. As opposed to making use of only local variables and parameters, which makes it e much easier to track you know, who is responsible and potentially can change what. <laughs> okay. Are there any questions about you know, variable, global variables? We're kind of running out of time you know, right now, so I'm gonna stop here. Um, so you want to read a little bit ahead of me, okay? Um, what we'll do is we'll continue to talk about the scope issues. Um, we probably won't be doing a whole lot with this stuff here until we get the control structure. Um, so you definitely want to get started with your homework assignments. You know, get it done, turn it in, and you know, so that you don't have to worry about it over the, uh, the long break. Next Monday, there's no class, okay? <coughs> Just to make sure that nobody comes here next Monday. Well, you can come here, but I won't be here. 
<laughs> if you want to come on you know, and get to ARC next Monday, sure, why not? You know, but I won't be here. There won't be any class on Monday. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. If there are no other questions, I'm going to stop the lecture here you know, and stop the recorder. If you have not signed in on the row sheet, you might want to do it you know, like after the class. And during the lab time, you know, you might want to get started with your homework assignment. You know, if you know how to get it done, just get it done and turn it in. If you don't know how to get it done, you know, I can kind of stop by and uh, give you a few hints. Okay. Right. So that's it for today for the lecture part.